Welcome. Want to welcome everybody to the first of three sessions this year on our Benefits and Compensation University. For those of you who have been with us the last few years, you may notice a little bit of a change in, in rebranding a bit. We used to do a day or afternoon of in-person, focused completely on exec comp, but this year we made a decision to pivot and broaden it on the benefits front. Um, hopefully, for those of you in the audience listening in, we, we think when we reflected on it, more responsibility for you all broader than probably executive compensation. Um, so next week we'll be doing a panel on qualified plans and the week after we'll be doing one on health and welfare. So, you know, we hope you can tune in for all three. We hope you find them useful. And, you know, even before COVID, we had debated a change in format to going to a webcast in an effort and hopefully to make it easier for you all to do a series of one and a half hour presentations rather than an afternoon or a day, which we understand everybody's busy. Um, we were debating that, and then, of course, COVID made the decision for us. Um, it was really the only choice that would work this year. But at the same time, you know, feedback, I think, on both of those thoughts and lines of thoughts and what we present on is very helpful because, of course, the overall goal is to provide, when we know everyone's busy, is to provide content that's helpful, gives you food for thought, gives you things to react to, um, and overall helps, you know, prepare you for, for what's going on and what's to come. So couple administrative thoughts up front. One, um, I'd like to introduce the co-panelists for today. Like I said, this is the first of three panels. Um, today, Katie, myself, and Jim Williams are attorneys in our employment and benefits practice here in Chicago. And Marsha Goodman, who's joining as well, is a litigator in the employment litigation group, but also here in Chicago. And our panel, as noted, is hot topics in executive compensation. So I, I don't want you to think we didn't consider whether we're overselling things, but we really do think these are hot topics. And then I laughed, by the way, I'm gonna flip back and forth between slides. Here we, of course, caveat it's hot topics in executive compensation. And then right away on slide one, I noticed a big error, which is we don't caveat it. So somehow we're out there just declaring that these are the hot topics. Um, and I laughed with my kids who, with TikTok, we don't have Fleetwood Max revival on here. So clearly we're not on the hottest and latest topics um, in terms of TikTok. But, but the reality is when I reflected even a little bit more, the reality is for all of us, there is one hot topic right now. We're all reacting to it. And we're all in a mode of trying to figure out the best path forward um, for our businesses and for what we do with employees and compensation and benefits and across all of these topics. We're all in reaction mode right now, trying to find a path forward. So I, I, ironically, I think for once, um, we're not just covering tax issues that only impact exec comp or tax issues that only impact certain things. We're talking about COVID, the pandemic, and the effect it's having on everyone. Um, and of course, how that applies to executive comp and legal issues. So, you know, the, the topics we intend to cover up front, I want to go through a few topics just at a high level of reacting, sort of what we're seeing for public and private companies. Jim's going to turn and then jump in on a topic that I think is really helpful with the impact of working from home, um, there are some compensation and reimbursement issues that um, clients should know about that are, you know, sort of existing rules, but being interpreted in a different light in reaction to the pandemic and everybody working from home. Katie's going to jump in on executive comp cases, giving us an update on some of the key cases from the last year. And we want to touch on some of the regulatory changes and the ISS reaction to COVID for public companies regulatory updates. And then we're going to turn to Marsha and Jim, who are going to do a session toward, you know, around the top of the hour, we'll turn to, we hope, um, issues with executives returning to the office. I mean, you know, there's a lot of questions and that I'm sure you all have and us as a business too, and reacting to the fact that everybody's been at home for a stretch or almost everybody. And then what do you do if and when there's times to shift in the thinking? Um, and then some odds and ends. And then finally, a summary on restrictive covenants and changes in state law. So with that and the overall summary, we'll um, jump in. So on the exec comp front, I, you know, I always want to start, there's this theory for any company. The idea is you pay for performance. That's the idea. That's the theory. You, you always want to align the executives with the investors, the shareholders. That's the idea. The problem is it's not perfectly possible. Um, and COVID, I think, unfortunately, in the pandemic is showing some of the pressure points some companies are adversely impacted by this pandemic through no fault of the executives. But the reality is shareholders will lose money if the company's not doing well. But the question is, if it's no fault of the executives, should the executives lose pay? 
And probably yes, but how much? And if you go too far with it to where all of the pay sort of drops off a cliff and they're not receiving anything, then you may have retention issues. And there's real debate, and I think there's no one size fits all for companies, but at a high level, we kind of just want to throw that topic out, right? That, that this is the theory of where exec comp has been for years. Um, and COVID's putting a lot of pressure on how do you maintain this theory at your companies um, as you move forward? And I'm just realizing, by the way, I wanted to pause. There was one other administrative or two other things I meant to cover um, that I didn't want is if you have questions as we go, there is a Q&A widget at the bottom. You can add in text some Q&A and we'll try to react to those either as we go or at the end. Um, and the other thing is if you're wanting CLE credit, um, halfway through Katie will announce a code and then we'll announce it again at the end, but you will need that code to get CLE credit. Just realized I forgot to mention those before. Okay, the, the, now flipping back or, or returning to the thought here, the issue with pay for performance is if you're trying to line comp with shareholders, there is a very big difference between what's common in public companies and private companies. Public companies have no horizon on investments, they have diverse shareholders and you serve a bunch of different masters, so to speak. Um, whereas with private companies, you're often, and we'll focus a little bit on private equity owned companies on the private side, but this is, you know, there's different life cycles for private companies. But often you have a very specific investor group that has a very specific timeline on how long they'd like to own the company. So the alignment with their interests are usually more known than it is in the public company context. And the way that plays out has a real impact on the way COVID's impacting companies. And just to touch on it real quick, the way that plays out in terms of the common compensation you see or sort of what's most typical, for a private company, there's base salary annual bonus, and then there's profits interests and capital interests that are granted. But the key is those are normally only done one time. They don't do annual equity grants. Whereas public companies tend to have a base salary and annual bonus that's more formulaic for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. And then annual equity grants, which are both re retention and performance, the difference, I mean, right away, you can spot one big difference when a pandemic sort of throws you off course. If you're making annual grants, you have the opportunity to consider just making prospective changes with the next round of annual grants. Whereas if you're a private company, you made one-time grants two years ago, what do you do? Do you adjust those? Do you not adjust those? And I think, you know, that, again, is impacting private and public companies a little bit differently in how they're thinking about it. So now to flip to a little bit of what we're seeing, um, on the public company side, we've seen a few things, none of which is universal, but we, we've gotten sort of a range of questions that are, are bullet points here, and I'll go into each a little bit. The first one is, there was a wave, and I, I saw a survey that said, I think as of the summer, like 16% of the S&P 500 had made adjustments to cash compensation. 40% of that was to the CEO salary. So not a majority, but it is impacting a lot of companies. And that question tended to come up in two flavors. One was the sort of voluntary CEO who wanted to give up their cash salary because the company was being hit hard. The company may be taking actions against employees in terms of comp, you know, furloughs, layoffs, and the CEO wanted to voluntarily give up some comp so that it looked like they were in together with the employees. The, the issue there is is that normally you can give up comp. You can voluntarily waive your right to compensation and you will not be taxed on it or the executive wouldn't be if the executive relinquishes all control over what happens to that money. But if the executive wants to control what happens to the money to say something like put it in an employee fund or put it in some sort of specific charity or control what the company spends it on, there's a chance they'd be taxed on that. So I want to highlight that issue if you have executives who are voluntarily asking for a reduction in cash comp, you want to make sure you analyze how much control they have over where that money goes. The other side is involuntary. What if the company just needs to reduce cash compensation across the board? Um, what's unique for executives in that fact pattern is they often have good reason protection, which means if you reduce their comp without their consent, they may be able to trigger good reason termination, which may also trigger vesting of equity and provide for severance payments. So that needs to be analyzed too, and you may need to get their consent up front, even if it's involuntary. Um, and then the one thing that comes up in both of these is what about the, let's give up cash comp and we'll take equity instead, which is also a common question, which shows is an attempt to say, we don't have a lot of cash now as a company, but I wanna buy in for the long term. I wanna show that I'm invested in this company for the long haul. 
just know that that type of exchange also can trigger tax issues and needs to be analyzed carefully as to whether or not that can occur without violating 49A. Um, so, you know, just note that as well. Again, it could be a good reason. It could be the executive wanting to do the right thing. Um, but you don't want to have an executive get caught with trying to do the right thing, but then get hit with adverse tax consequences. The next thing we're seeing a lot of questions on or is coming up frequently for public companies, what do we do with annual performance goals? So years ago, performance goals were set because of 162M and the performance-based comp exception, as most of you, I think, all know, that went away a few years ago. And for annual comp, there's no longer a need to set objective performance goals for tax reasons. But most public companies started years ago doing that anyway for securities disclosure reasons, which is they wanted the disclosure of the annual comp to not be made in the discretionary bonus column of the summary comp table, but rather to be moved over to the non-equity incentive comp column. And the way that that works is you have to have objective goals that are established and communicated to executives at a time when they're, it's uncertain whether or not they'll be achieved. Um, so for companies that have been disclosing their annual comp as non-equity incentive comp, if you make adjustments, it puts pressure on that analysis. And I think if you set goals and you end up making changes and or paying a discretionary bonus that's in excess of what the original goals would have paid out, that excess is almost certainly going to be disclosed as a discretionary bonus, which may not be the end of the world in this year or the end of the world this year. I, I will note for a couple of surveys, Willis Towers Watson said that you know, 50% of companies, this is from, I think, August, are considering not making changes, but using discretion at the end of the year to pay a bonus if, if they feel like it's warranted based on the circumstances. 25% were considering adjusting the goals. 25% were considering putting in new goals. Um, so wherever you're at with that, I think a lot of companies are considering this. The really difficult part, and I'll get in a minute to where ISS is on this. ISS wants contemporary dis disclosure or contemporaneous disclosure of when you make changes. So they want to know when you do it and why. And then that will need to be re-explained in the proxy next year, but you won't get feedback from ISS until you do the proxy filing. They're sort of saying case by case basis. I think they know a lot of companies are going to need to do this and are considering doing it, but they're not, you know, I'll get in a minute. The ISS advisory wing did a case, did four case studies and so they've shown their hand a little bit about the way they're thinking about it. But the key on the advisory wing of ISS is the voting side is not bound by their recommendations. And in fact, they always disavow that they'll always follow what the consulting side or the advisory side says. So it's helpful to sort of know what they're thinking, but it's there's no guarantee that the ISS voting side will agree with them. Um, and then again, be able to explain it to the shareholders. If you make the decision the recommendation will be generally to explain now what you're thinking, but to then again explain it in the proxy. And then for long-term equity, for existing grants, we've had companies inquire, but I haven't had a client yet at least, and I don't know if the other panelists have had any, yet. not yet make changes to the long-term performance goals for equity. There is definitely consideration being given to changing the, coal, the goals for the next cycle of grant, um, but not yet changes. And there's a couple things. A lot of companies over the last several years have started using relative TSR. Relative goals sort of self-adjust for things that impact the entire peer group. Um, but a lot of companies have an absolute minimum performance before it vests. So even if you have relative TSR, it may still require a positive TSR or something like that over a period of time. So that even if you do well among your peers, they still may not vest. Um, and then stock options, a down market, of course, puts pressure on previously granted stock options. We've seen a little bit, but not a lot yet of stock option repricing, um, but it's something else that you know, companies need to consider. It's not easy to do because it requires shareholder approval. It's not cheap or easy necessarily, but in the right circumstances, it can be the right thing to do if you have a lot of existing grants that are less likely now to pay out and have retention value. So something to consider. On the private company side, there is pressure put on the one-time grant concept. So for those of you who work in the private equity space, frequently executives are made a one-time grant of profits interest. And profits interest represent a right to future upside in the company. They're like a stock option. They have a price, and you only share in value above that price. Um, the key is if you only get a one-time grant and a company's hurting right now and those are viewed as underwater, you're going to lose your retention value for executives. So we have had companies start to call and ask about potentially repricing profits interests, um, i.e., 
lowering that value. Um, and Jim's going to jump in here in a minute, too. He wanted to note, and I agree with this, a few legal issues to consider if you're doing that. And then the other thing to note for private companies is frequently the vesting is based also on some sort of EBITDA and or um, a lot of times an IRR is used, which is a function of value of time. And then there's a question of should those goals be reset based on where things are now and given executives an opportunity to dig out if the company's not performing as well right now through no fault of the executives, do you reset it now so that they view them as, again, being achievable results? So I'll let Jim jump in on a couple of legal thoughts on this, too. Yeah, as most of you know, a profit's interest is roughly analogous to a stock option. And you set the exercise price at the value of the stock on the date of grant so that a stock option allows you to uh, um, share in the gain in the stock, but it doesn't allow you to share in what the value of the stock on the date of grant. Profits interest, instead of having an exercise price, has a threshold. And that threshold is equivalent to the value of the of the profits of this um, the profits, uh, I'm sorry, the capital interest of the of the LLC or the partnership on the date of grant, um, and it is tended to do the same thing. Um, just as uh, options are coming underwater and uh, companies are thinking about lowering the exercise price or repricing uh, in order to deal with that, uh, many co private companies who offer profits interest to their executives are thinking about lowering the threshold so that uh, they made it, the profits interests are reset to what the value of the company is now. Um, it's, there's not a lot of guidance out there on what the effect of that is. Um, is it a new grant as a result of the, the lowering of the value? Is it, um, is it only a new grant to the extent of the difference between the old threshold and the new threshold? And should you make a Section 83B election? The purposes of making a Section 83B election with respect to a profits interest is twofold. Number one, if you get the threshold wrong so that you're in the money on the date of grant, or two, if you fall out of the safe harbor for the profits interest because there's a sale of disposition of the profits interest within two years. Um, my own view is Section 83B elections with respect to profits interests are protective. And I am advising clients to make the Section 83B election, but it's not you know, it's, it's, it's still up in the air. There's no real definitive guidance on this. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And I think, you know, always to the pressure point, but for those of you who are not as familiar with profits interest, it's always worth noting that the reason that, that what Jim's noting is so important is that if done correctly, while they deliver the same economic return as a stock option in the corporate context, the stock option, the gain is ordinary income. In the private equity context, the profits interest delivers the same upside or at least a similar concept of upside. But if you do things correctly, it's taxed as capital gain. And so I agree with Jim. The pressure point is if it's a new grant or you analyze it that way, you make the, the 83B election. But you need to discuss with the company the runway sort of between now when you do the repricing and when they do still ultimately expect to sell the company because if there isn't enough runway, it may put pressure on that analysis. To Jim's point, the two-year hold period for the safe harbor. Um, so there's different things to consider, but you, you want to make sure that you give people who are receiving them the chance to hold them and, and get the the tax, the desired tax outcome, which is far different than stock options. So yeah, go ahead, Jim, and then you're up next on the reimbursement stuff. So I'll turn it sure. over to you. Yeah. And, the, and the unfortunate news, I guess, or from a profits interest perspective, good news is many companies are probably going to extend their time horizon for selling the company as a result of the COVID so that you will be within the two year holding period, safe harbor for profits interest in the one year period for capital gains regardless. But um, it's something to think about when you're when you're if you're thinking of lowering the threshold on your profits interest. Okay. With that, Ryan, should I proceed? Okay. I think this is um, a lot of companies, a uh, huge amount of companies are having their workers uh, at home, uh, whether it's by state mandate, whether it's by um, voluntarily, or whether it's by some other reason. 
And um, the question then becomes, all right, they're working at home, they have their own computer or not, or they have your computer, they have their cell phone, or maybe they have your cell phone. Uh, they probably don't have your Wi-Fi, um, and they probably uh, are running out to the store just the way you might be, picking up some more paper to put in the printer. And they may be using your printer, perhaps they brought a printer from, from the office. So the question then becomes, what is the law relative to what you're required to do in terms of reimbursing employees for expenses? Um, and it's a question of both state and federal law. Uh, this, the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, oh, by the way, my colleague, Marsha Goodman, may be uh, jumping in from time to time, and she's welcome to do so whenever she wishes. Um, she reins me in appropriately most times. Um, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act um, doesn't have a specific provision uh, saying you must pay this, you must pay that with respect to expenses that employees incur. But what it does say is that, um, is that uh, you cannot um, require employees to pay for um, um, expenses relating to working it from home if it's going to cause their wages to fall below the minimum wage. Now, it's likely that most of you listening here do not have that issue because you're paying well above the minimum wage. But it's something to keep in mind if you do have a segment of your population where that could be an issue and where they are working from home and incurring expenses. Most states do have a statute requiring employees to reimburse uh, employers to reimburse employees for some expenses uh, that they need to perform in their jobs. The, the state laws vary tremendously across the country. Um, if it's a potential issue, uh, employers should consider what, what potential expenses that workers may have and whether an expense reimbursement policy for remote workers is advisable. I would hope and I would expect that most of you are looking at your expense reimbursement policies because I'm sure, particularly in some states, you're getting questions. Uh, for And then one thing to consider, um, I mean, lots of employers are under pressure in terms of their revenue, but for those employers that are not as pressured, if you in the past, such as a lot of this time it occurs in California, if you've been in reimbursing employers employees for parking expenses or for, uh, in the case of New York or other jurisdictions, including Chicago, if you've been reimbursing employees uh, for uh, commuting costs, uh, you perhaps can take those dollars saved and then reallocate them to reimbursing employees for expenses. Um, in, in terms of st state statutes, by far the, the 800 pound gorilla is California. California has an express and longtime statutory requirement that uh, employers reimburse employees for all necessary expenditures or losses incurred by the employer in direct consequence of the discharge of his or her duties. Um, this has been interpreted very, very broadly. And so um, when, if you have employees who are working remotely in California, you certainly should be considering uh, expense reimbursement uh, policies and claims. Uh, continuing with California, um, again, it's expansively interpreted, uh, would potentially apply to materials and services required for a remote, remote worker to do his or her job. And things that have come up are Wi-Fi access, um, computer, uh, if, if the employee is using his or her own computer, printer, mobile phone, pager, office supplies. Um, many other state have, states are moving in this direction, but do not have the, um, this type of expansive statute now, uh, but we'll talk about a few other states in a moment. Um, if you have uh, employees across multiple states, you may wish to consider um, a uniform policy, even if it's not statutorily re required. Um, one of my clients has a number of employees in California, and as they have mentioned, they're, um, they, they also have employees in other states, and they say the employees talk to each other all the time. So the employees are very cognizant of what is being reimbursed in, in California. Um, 
One of the things about the California um, reimbursement statute, it has been interpreted to require reimbursement of of services that um, the employee may already have. And for example, Wi-Fi access. Most of our most of us now have Wi-Fi access in our home. Um, and one would think, well, perhaps I don't have to reimburse for Wi-Fi access because the employee already owns it. If the employee is using his or her Wi-Fi uh, to access the company systems or to do his or her job, then there's then you would be well advised to do an apportionment. And that is in reimbursing employees, you should, would apportion in a reasonable manner um, their use of their Wi-Fi for purposes of doing their job. Why is this important? Uh, California uh, Labor Code 2802 is tough. There's a three-year claims period. Uh, there's Private Attorney General Act claims and penalties. There's statutory in interest of 10%, payment of attorney fees, and uh, as I tell everyone, the pastime of America is not baseball, it's litigation, and so everybody knows a lawyer, and so there's, and, and, and the plaintiff's attorneys are very, very well aware of California Labor Code 2802 for purposes of individual and class action litigation. Um, Illinois has a statute that uh, on bo its books as well. Uh, note that uh, it requires an employer to reimburse um, for expenses or losses, uh, but, in, but note in section B that an, an employee is not entitled to reimbursement under this section if the employer has established a written expense reimbursement policy and the employee has failed to comply with it. Here's some other statutes that I'm just going to go ahead, Marsha. It looks like you want to say something. Oh, I was just going to, going to say about California, uh, going back a, a slide, you're abs I couldn't get off mute quickly enough, but um, you're, uh, you're absolutely right that the key in California is that before you know it, uh, if, if employees raise an issue, you may be in court facing a class action, whereas in most of the other states, the, the traditional approach, though there are options, but the traditional approach is for employees to go to the State Department of Labor. So the employer has usually has the opportunity to consider the issue and often resolve it before you have a class action lawyer looking to get lots of fees. And Cal California, as you mentioned, is the opposite. So it's a good reason to pay attention to California along with all your other states. Thanks, Marcia. And then turning to a few other uh, state um, laws that are more specifically addressing uh, employee expenses, um, District of Columbia has one. Minnesota is an odd one. It requires an employer upon an employee's termination of employment uh, to reimburse the employee for previously deducted amounts from an employee's wages for certain items, including consumable supplies required in employment and travel expenses other than community expenses. So if you have employees in, in Minnesota, you should be mindful of this in terms of when you have a termination process. Iowa the, is... Um, you can benefit under, in Iowa from an employee expense reimbursement policy. What you need to be careful of, and this applies to many states, and that is you need to pay it by the statutory deadline, which is not later than 30 days, unless uh, you have a written justification for refusing to pay. Montana, Montana's statute is written very similarly to California's. So in, in looking and in, in, in um, administering an expense reimbursement policy in Montana, you should be mindful of that. Uh, as I note on the bottom, the good news is there's just not that many people in Montana. Um, but if you do have people in Montana, uh, you should be paying, paying attention to that. Um, New Hampshire is one of, the, one of the states that has a requirement that you reimburse employees within 30 days of submitting expenses. Uh, Pennsylvania has, uh, if you state a, um, a deadline in your in whatever policy you have, it has to be within 10 days. 
um, and it, within 60 days where there's no required time payment. New York uh, doesn't have um, a, a New York's law doesn't apply to um, uh, most employee, employees because they're not going to be non-exempt employees. Um, but Marsha, did you want to say something about New York law? You're on mute. I, you know, you and I had talked about the fact that um, in in a lot of these states, what you have are pre-existing laws requiring uh, employers to pay for the cost of employees performing their work. And that's really what you have in New York as well. Um, and uh, but but that the trick is that even though these laws in 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 California, there's there's new things. In Illinois, there are new things. In some other states, there are new things. But even where there isn't anything new, as in New York, the interpretation um, has evolved with what's happening, and there's there's a new uh, sense in the state. Um, agencies as well as among employees that employers have obligations to to foot costs even if perhaps the employees would have had these costs anyway such as the wi-fi right and um in thinking about this marcia i mean what a lot of companies do in california is they adopt a reasonable apportion apportionment for for instance for wi-fi they figure the employee is working eight hours to 10 hours a day. And so they reimburse a corresponding amount. Is that something, is that sound, you know, in the ballpark? Yeah, I think that that approach can certainly can work in um, most in California, the, you know, the courts and the agencies have been pretty clear that a reasonable apportionment works of Wi-Fi and uh, and internet and uh, cell phone expenses works in California. It it also would generally be sufficient to work in the other states. And the more complicated question is, what if the employer you know doesn't want to do that? Uh, and is already paying for other expenses that can be used in work from home and, and thinks that, you know, they're, they're already paying enough, um, then it, 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 the employer may be right, but it requires a careful analysis of what costs an employee has to uh, incur in order to effectively do their job at home and to what extent the employer is providing the method, either the equipment or the reimbursement or uh, resources access so that the employee can, um, can work at home uh, without funding that work through, through his or her own resources. Super. It, one question real quick, Jim and Marcia, that did come in, and, it, and it's nicely, since the question came in, I think you've pivoted a little bit and answered it, but it was D.C. law specific, but it was, I think, to get your reaction to the idea of what about expenses the employee has already incurred? They just like Wi-Fi, like you're saying, Wi-Fi and Internet, they've paid for it themselves for years, but suddenly they're working at home. And like, again, this was specific to DC statute, but I think overall, right, what's what's your reaction to that? Like you were already footing that bill, now you're working from home, right. and you're sort of covered. And I think you gave some ideas about bifurcation and or sort of allocation, but I don't mm -hmm. know if you have a general response. I do think, right, it's a good question because employees probably for the most part had already incurred a lot of these expenses. Yeah, it, it is the key question. And um, it, it, what's, it, it, COVID has changed the way uh, a lot of a, a lot of laws, a lot of practices um, are looked at. So, for instance, pre-COVID, in most cases, working from home was an option that the employee selected, and that affects the employer's obligation or lack of obligation to pay the costs. 
But once we started with lockdowns and only essential workers could work in the office and m most employers were telling their employees to work from home whenever, you know, whenever the employer could manage that. In that case, now the employees required to work from home. And so then the employees required to have a certain level of equipment and service in order to perform the services. And so it, it, the way the agencies are looking at it, it's no longer enough to say, well, you had it anyway, so I as the employer am not paying for it. But in some cases, you can think of it, the employer can think of it a little bit differently. For instance, if the employer pays all cell phone costs and all data costs on, on the cell phone, then the employee could, in theory, use their cell phone Wi-Fi hotspot in order to get the internet access they need. And in that case, you could take the position that we're paying for what you need. If you choose to have home internet access and Wi-Fi, that's your choice, but it's not our obligation to pay for that. And the ultimate answer for, um, for any particular employer is going to depend on the details of the facts of what they're already paying for, what they require their employees to have or to to, to do in order to perform their job and whether or not the remote access is required or optional. And that changed obviously with lockdowns. Potentially it will change again when employees come back to the office, but that's a later section. Well, that's coming up right now. Um, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I think the takeaway from this is employers have to be proactive. Uh, employees are paying attention to making claims. Um, review expense reimbursement policies like vacation policies. They need to, you know, you can have a policy that is nationwide, but they need to be state specific in some instances. And so you should be very, very mindful of that. Uh, determine what equipment employees actually need to effectively do their jobs explain what is what is not necessary one of the ways is you know it goes a long way sometimes if you explain to an employee why you, you think it's not necessary for them to do something and why you won't reimburse it um, and then uh, particularly in, in states like California uh, settle disputes promptly that's, that's that can be very important um, and um, what it, what's, what's going to happen when we return to the office? Um, I think that the, the questions the questions are going to be um, well when you return to the office uh, is it your choice or is it your employers um, if there's no mandate to stay at home uh, and it can be interpreted as a voluntarily I think even in a place like California um, it, the employer will have more discretion to say no I'm not reimbursing you for your Wi-Fi because you're working at home by your choice Marcy you have any comments on that Yes. So what, what we're seeing employers do on this, on this point is actually first to look at the business, the business aspect of it. Um, do they want people to work from home? Have they, have, has the employer changed their own perspective so that they are seeing some benefits to people working from home or even if they don't see benefits, perhaps they are seeing that in order to keep the talent that's really important to them, they have to make it uh, appealing to, uh, to perform the services, to make it easy rather than hard. And so, as I said, what we're seeing employers do is first look at the business needs and the business um, benefits of providing reimbursements and then once they've settled on what they want to do, then they'll ask us to look at the state laws and make sure that they're sufficiently complying. But I, I heartily approve of taking the business approach first and deciding what they really, what the employer really wants their employees to have in order to get, 
you know, the best services from their employees, and then looking at the state laws. And in a lot of cases, you'll find that the business approach actually puts you in a place that's consistent with the laws, but it's important to check. Um, one uh, thing which has come up um, mm -hmm. as a result of some of these expense reimbursement issues is if you are um, acquiring or if you are selling, um, whether you have uh, liabilities for failure to repay um, expense reimbursements. Uh, this has come up uh, for several clients in the context of the merger and acquisition. Uh, we are, depending upon the circumstances, we are sometimes putting uh, representation and warranties regarding uh, expense reimbursement compliance in our purchase agreements. And if you are, uh, you know, if you are in a acquisition or disposition mode, you should think about that. And for jurisdictions like California, you should, you know, look back as to what you've done during the COVID era um, so that you can be assured that uh, you're not going to have a very, very unexpected liability for expense reimbursements. Thank you very much. We'll turn it over to uh, it's Katie next. Yeah, think, real quick, Jim, before Katie jumps in, there's one more issue on the state. I just want to mention this and turn it then quickly to Katie so we can get to the cases. But one other thing to focus on with employees working from home that we've had come up is state tax withholding. And so I, oh, yeah. I just, you know, particularly you can imagine the cities where this is a big deal, right? If you have, if you're a New York based company and a lot of your employees are working from home in Connecticut or New Jersey, does this matter? Does it need to matter for withholding and how will it impact their taxes? And I, you know, again, wanted to quickly mention this. We do have within the firm state and local tax experts. So if you call on this question or ask, we're going to put you in contact with them. But it is a question you should start asking before year end and making sure that you're in a position and you've reviewed these issues, you're in a position to defend whatever tax position you're taking. Because um, there's certainly an awareness of this growing as well, that people are working in different states and how does that impact their state tax obligation? Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Katie and the cases. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, so I'm gonna pivot just a little bit um, to some interesting cases in within um, 2020. And um, we're gonna start with 409A. Um, up until recently, there wasn't a whole lot of litigation on 409A. Um, as a little bit of background, um, Section 409A, the Internal Revenue Code governs the payment of non-qualified deferred compensation. Um, violations of Section 409A trigger adverse tax consequences for the service provider, so typically the employee, including immediate taxation of vested benefits under the plan and all similar plans, plus a 20% additional income tax and penalty interest. Until recently, employers were focused on relatively minor reporting and withholding obligations that result from 409A failures, but um, litigation from participants may start becoming sort of an increased risk. Uh, a couple of recent cases highlight this trend. The first case um, comes out of the Northern District of Illinois, and this is Rabbi Stanley Kroll v. Cozen O'Connor. Kroll served as a rabbi at Chicago Loop Synagogue for nearly 40 years. And as part of his compensation, CLS both guaranteed his compensation through 2020, and they established a deferred compensation plan to fund his retirement. In 2016, in order to cut expenses, CLS asked Kroll to retire at the end of the year, and Kroll agreed. Um, Kroll elected to receive his deferred comp in 15 annual installments. Um, on the last day of his employment, CLS told him that there was an unexplained tax issue that had arisen, but they assured him that it would be resolved and he could go ahead and retire. Um, after his retirement, Kroll discovered that CLS had not resolved the tax issue and that Ann had not been compliant since 2005. Um, in 2017, CLS's attorneys at Cozen O'Connor told Kroll that they had drafted an enforceable amendment to the plan that would resolve the 49A issue. Uh, Cozen used that and the purported enforceability of the amendment to force him into accepting only 50% of what he was due under the plan. Um, Kroll first sued CLS, claiming fraud and breach of fiduciary duty, and the parties settled in 2018. 
And as part of that settlement, CLS assigned to Kroll all claims it may have had against Cozen uh, concerning the plan and the amendment. So in May of 2019, Kroll sued Cozen, asserting a, the assigned malpractice claim, as well as his own claims for aiding and abetting fraud, fiduciary duty, and fraudulent concealment. So he claimed that there were both funding issues and 49A failures, and so they seemed to reduce the retirement income and use the promise of this fixed amendment to pressure him into accepting a reduced benefit. So the court most of these claims, but they did not dismiss the aiding and abetting fraud claim. Um, the second case of the circuit, um, this one is Wilson v. Safe Light Group, Inc., and it also involves the claim following a Section 498 failure. Um, Dan Wilson, the former president and CEO of Safe Light, sued Safe Light for a breach of contract and negligent misrepresentation, both, both of which are state law claims, um, arising from the company's alleged mismanagement of its deferred company. Um, in, 20, in, in 2006, the board adopted a non qualified compensation plan to allow participants to defer their compensation. And by 2014, Wilson had over $9 million in deferred comp under the plan. Uh, that year, a federal audit revealed that some of Wilson's elections did not comply with Section 409A and as a result, owed some taxes and incurred substantial tax penalties. So ultimately, the court dismissed claims for breach of contract and negligent misrepresentation to the fact that the plan was uh, an employee benefit plan governed by ERISA. So his state law claims were preempted by ERISA. But it remains unclear whether Wilson would have been entitled to any relief for the failure under ERISA. These cases together just kind of illustrate that it might, be, it might be a more common tool for plan participants to hold their employers accountable for 498 failures when it affects compensation. Um, moving away from 409A. Um, the third case I want to talk about is a case involving post-employment competitive activity out of the force circuit. And in this case, um, Allegiant Group Inc. sponsored an incentive investment plan under which highly compensated employees could elect to earn units, title them the incentive payments for 30 months following their separation from service, as long as they agreed to refrain from competing with, soliciting customers of, or rating employers from any Allegiant company. So four former employees who had elected to participate in the plan decided to form and engage in a competitive business before the expiration of that 30-month period. The company sued them to recoup the incentive payments that they had received under the plan. And the former employees argued that the conditions for payments were legally unenforceable under Maryland law that governs covenant because they're overly broad and not reasonably tailored to protect business interests. And the court held that based on the plain text, the plan's provisions cannot be characterized as covenant as they don't constitute a prohibition on the employees engaging in competitive work. They're not requiring a forfeiture of benefits for non-compliance, but rather for established conditions for receipt of additional benefits. So in other words, the employees chose to participate in the plan, and in order to earn the payments under the plan, they had agreed to comply with these conditions that were clearly laid out in the plan. The court found that this type of arrangement is not subject to laws governing restrictive covenants. Um, so the text of the plan was clear in describing its purpose and describing the conditions for earning the benefit. And um, we just thought this was an important lesson for those of us drafting these type of, types of arrangements. Um, next um, is a case out of the Supreme Court of Delaware, and it involves a brief fiduciary duty claim that followed the merger of Towers Watson and Willis. Um, under the merger agreement, despite the fact that Towers had stronger performance and greater market capitalization, Willis stockholders were to receive the authority of the post-merger company, and Towers stockholders would receive a special benefit along with their minority interest. John Haley was then CEO and chairman of Towers and was responsible for spearheading the merger on behalf of Towers. Um, in connection with the negotiations, uh, an institutional stockholder, Willis, presented Haley with a compensation proposal with the post merger company that would increase compensation fivefold. Haley did not uh, disclose this proposal to Towers. 
So after the printer's public announcement, the transaction received a lot of bad press. Um, several practice advisory firms, including ISS, recommended that Tower stockholders vote against the merger, and stockholders started sort of questioning whether Tower's management sent a line to their interest. Uh, given the pressure, Haley renegotiated the transaction terms, increased the amount of special dividend, and Towers ultimately obtained the shareholder approval. So the deal closed. Haley became CEO of Willis Towers and was given a compensation package similar to what was proposed. Uh, several Towers stockholders sued, alleging breach of duty of loyalty and breach of fiduciary and they claimed that Haley had negotiated the bare minimum dividend to get the merger approved. Um, the Delaware Chancellor's Court agreed to Smith's claim, holding that the judgment rule applied. Uh, however, on appeal, the Delaware Supreme Court held that the plaintiff sufficiently alleged that Haley was materially in He failed to disclose this compensation proposal to the Towers Court, and a reasonable board member would have found Haley's material interest a, a significant fact in the evaluation of the merger. So the claim of, uh, for breach of fiduciary duty against Haley survived the motion to dismiss. So although this case has fairly unique facts, um, it's an interesting example of overcoming the presumption of the business, um, especially in the, the M&A context. Um, the final update on this session is not a, not a case, but an SEC enforcement action against Argo Group International Holdings Limited. Um, and we phrase this action as an illustration of sort of a heightened area of scrutiny. Um, on, on June 4th, 2020, the SEC issued an Argo for its failure to disclose in its proxy statements that from 2014 through 2018, it paid over $5.3 million to its then CEO and president, Mark Watson, in the form of a wide range of perquisites and personal benefits. Um, so items that Argo paid for on Watson's behalf but did not disclose included expenses related to personal use of um, corporate aircraft and automobiles, rent, other housing costs, helicopter trips, personal travel, car service used by his family members, um, club memberships, tickets, watercraft, et cetera. So uh, getting quite a bit there. In, in, in addition, um, Argo failed to devise and maintain internal accounting controls related to these payments that were sufficient to provide reasonable assurances that the transactions were reported as necessary to maintain accountability for their assets. So in connection with the enforcement action, Argo took several remedial actions, including a thorough investigation, um, revision of its compensation processes and policies, they replaced the CEO, they entered into an agreement to get repayment of some of those costs, and um, they changed the composite compensation of their uh, board of directors. So the SEC ordered that Argo cease and desist from committing or causing similar violations in the future. And they also imposed a civil money penalty in the amount of $900,000, which the SEC noted was more limited than they would have otherwise imposed um, in consideration for their remedial actions and cooperation. So again, there's to be a current focus of the SEC's enforcement activity and, and attention should be given to those um, compensation arrangements and related policies, um, as well as their proper disclosure. Um, now I'll turn it over to Ryan for ISS and shareholder concerns. All right, thanks, Katie. And I and I will go fairly quickly through this because it ties back to a lot of what I discussed at the beginning. But I do want particularly public company um, clients who are listening to know that this stuff is out there. ISS pretty quickly in April had commentary out on COVID. The hard part was it wasn't particularly definitive or helpful. It's just really they want you, if you are going to make changes, to disclose it, again, to contemporaneously. Um, they don't favor changes in long-term goals, um, but case-by-case -case review. So um, I think, again, there's they know and there's an understanding a lot of companies need to do these things, but there's no real definitive guidance on what to do. Now, again, the consulting side, ISS Corporate Solutions, re released four case studies, and here's the highlights. But again, for these, the, the main takeaway is, is that 
you know, if you make adjustments or you make changes, the theory shouldn't be that the person gets the same amount of money for a reduced performance. There should be some give and take. So like case study one, adjusting the goals, but a reduction in the payout amounts by 25% for sort of threshold um, maximum, well, threshold target and maximum. Case study two was a similar half year goals, a mid-year switch, but then a reduction in payment by 50%. Interestingly, case studies three and four were changing goals from absolute performance to relative. And in that case, they didn't necessarily feel a need to do a reduction in payout amounts. So as long as there was a cap for negative absolute performance, um, you know, as long as you were outperforming your peers in this environment, there was some argument, or at least the consulting side thought there was some argument for um, still having full payout, um, but completely different goals, of course. Um, and then, you know, ISS released a survey, I think, a week ago or a week before. There's just some thoughts here on kind of what they're seeing. But really, again, the, the general answer is lots of companies are thinking about it. There's no clear answers on what people are doing. Um, and But it, it's out there. They know what's out there, and people are thinking and talking about it. So that's for a couple other issues. I just want to mention these quickly because, and I, I want to note the statistics, uh, it, Willis Towers Watson did a survey this summer that 27% of the survey respondents said that they now have some component of these types of issues built into performance goals. It may not be the only performance goal, but it's at least now a factor. And they said an additional 27% are considering it. So it could be a year from now that half the public companies have some component of this built into performance goals. And it really ties to, you know, the theoretical, there's a lot of um, commentary out there on the purpose of a corporation. There's this long-standing view that a corporation is there to maximize profits for shareholders or maximize return for shareholders. And these sorts of goals are not necessarily in alignment with absolute shareholder return. And the reason comp committees and companies have to give this thought is you have to be able to defend if you move away from totally sort of Again, backing way up, if your theory is pay for performance, it's pay for which performance and what do you maximize? And historically, it's been pay for performance on return for shareholders. Now, there's been differentiation in how that's measured, but generally that's been the overall concept and goal, particularly for public companies. If that gets revisited, then you have to have sort of a cultural shift in the way you think about the purpose of the business. In lots of companies, you know, as we all know, are not only building some of these components in, they're taking stands to actually increase their business. And I don't know, you know, that that's an easy thing for companies to do or to consider. But interestingly, a lot of it seems to come back to the comp committee. So, you know, who makes these decisions within a public company? Who's responsible? Um, unfortunately, a lot of it is coming back to the comp committee because the theory being, again, what are you paying executives to do? And, I, you know, again, there's a lot here. It's a little bit beyond, and we'll get a little bit into cause in a minute. Marsha and Jim are going to talk about cause. And then, you know, again, clawback policies. But I also want to note even broader than sort of positive goals aligned with ESG goals, which are listed here. I do think companies have to think about the new world of an executive does something that's detrimental to the company um, that may or may not be something that was normally caught or historically caught by a cause definition and or a clawback policy? And does that need to be reconsidered? Does a company need to be ready for an executive who does something that negatively impacts the business, but not historically would have been considered cause or purposes of a clawback, right? And there's examples from the last few years of very public situations where executives got huge severance payouts, even though they did something that was clearly harmful to the company's reputation, business, et cetera. So I just throw that out there again as something to consider. And for those of you who advise compensation committees, they seem to be the pressure point of people within the company who have to really sort of take the lead on some of this or at least give it thought. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over. We're gonna do a quick regulatory advice and then try to get it back to Jim um, and Marsha at the end, but Katie's gonna update. There was some FICA guidance that I think we think is important too. So I'll turn it back to Katie. And very exciting as all the FICA guidance is. Um, so the IRS, release two informal updates to guidance on income inclusion timing and withholding and deposit rules for stock options, stock settled, stock appreciation rights, and restricted stock units. Um, first, the IRS issued a generic legal advice memorandum, which outlines the views of the IRS with respect to the timing of income inclusion, application to FICA, and FIT withholding, 
and deposit obligations for the three types of stock settled equity awards. Um, second, the IRS issued uh, a section of the Internal Revenue or Internal Review Manual to um, expand the categories of equity awards eligible for certain administrative relief from the penalties of the next day deposit rule and, and to slightly tighten the conditions for that relief. So first, um, in the memo, um, and I'm risking getting way too technical here, but it's important to know this guidance is out there when, if and when you need to dig into it specifically. But um, with respect to the stock options, the IRS reaffirmed its long-held position that the fair market value minus the exercise price of the shares of stock transferred to an employee pursuant to a stock option are includable in income on the date that the employee exercises that option. Um, in addition, the memo takes the position that this amount is treated as wages paid to the employee on the exercise date. So they figure the employer's FICA and fit withholding obligations on that date, even though the shares and settlement of the option might not be deposited in the brokerage account. Okay. Um, with respect to SARS, upon the exercise of an SAR, um, an employee is entitled to the number of shares of stock equal to the difference between the fair market value of a share on the date of exercise minus its fair market value on the date of grant divided by the fair market value on the date of exercise. So the fair market value of the shares received on the date of exercise is includable in income by the employee and constitutes wages paid subject to FICA and FIT. So similar to the options, the date of exercise is the liability incurred date and the date that triggers the requirement for the employer to permit FICA and FIT back to the exercise, even though, again, it might be a couple days for the um, deposit. Um, for RSUs, the employee's income inclusion is triggered on the date that the shares are transferred under Section 83. So the memo takes the position that the transfer of shares occurs when the employer initiates the transfer, even though it might take up to two days for the shares to be deposited in the brokerage account. The fair market value of the shares on date uh, on that day constitutes wages of the spike and fit holding. And the date that the employee employer initiates the transfer triggers the requirement for the employer to remit FICA and FIT with respect to the transfer again, even though um, the settlement shares might not be happening for two days. Um, under the new guidance in the manual update, the um, in the case of stock options and SARS, the, the settlement date rather than the exercise date of the award will be treated as the liability incurred date for purposes of calculating failure to deposit penalties under the one day rule, provided that the settlement date is within two days of the exercise date. And similarly, in the case of RSUs, the settlement date rather than the transfer initiation date will be treated as the liability incurred date for penalty purposes. Again provided that the settlement date is within two days of the transfer initiation date. So after that thrilling update, I'll pass it back to Ryan for once again. Remember though, Katie, these were all certified hot topics. So don't sell any of them short. These are all hot topics. But the one thing I want to add to what Katie said there, of course, is volatile market puts pressure on that. So again, in a fairly steady market, that day or two distinction may not be the end of the world. But in a volatile market, it can put a lot of pressure on getting that precisely right. So I think the guidance is helpful. And I think our reaction generally was for options and SARS, that's what we always thought. For RSUs, I think companies should really focus on if that's the way they do it. So, you know, when you initiate to your stock transfer, you know, you call for the stock transfer, that's when you would do the inclusion um, and you need to record the value for income tax purposes. And I'm not sure that that's universal across the board. So I, I think it's important to focus on that. Um, and I will say, Katie, real quick, while I do the last little bit of reform, somebody did ask, or the, the regulatory changes for the CLE code again. So if you don't mind sort of skipping back and read that off again in a minute. 162M and um, 4960 are the next two things. And we've covered those. We covered them last year. There, for both of those, there was proposed regulations that were issued in the last um, year. So I want to mention that that occurred Again, the slides capture some of our thoughts from the last year, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time, and we have more important topics to get to. But I do want to note for 162M and, and to plug our blog, but I do intend to do a blog post on this. If you have a deferred comp plan that delays payment for deductibility under 162M, which was fairly common before to maximize the deduction, there is some forgiveness to remove that 
provision by the end of this year without violating 49A. But if you don't do it by the end of this year, you can't and you have to live with it. And because of the new permit, the lack of performance-based comp exception, because covered employees is a permanent designation, if you don't remove that, it could cause a significant delay in payment for some executives of some of their comp down the road. So I, I do want to note that um, that's the 162M. And then on 4960, there's this quick fact pattern that I want to hit again because most of you are for-profit companies. If you have a related not-for-profit that's related to your for-profit entity and the executives perform services for that, you have to understand 4960, and we need to do an analysis as to whether or not this excise tax could apply to that fact pattern because this excise tax applies to ex certain executives of not-for-profits. But if there's control of a not-for-profit by a for-profit company, this analysis can apply to them as well. So there were proposed regs put out. They have some exceptions that are on this slide that are noted to that, which are helpful, but not necessarily a perfect solution for everyone. So again, I think if that fact pattern applies, I just want to note this issue and, and raise it as something that's out there. Um, so those, are, I think, are the big topics. Katie, for real quick, you want to read the CLE code again if you can, and then we'll turn it over to Marsha and Jim for the, their thoughts here now at the end. Okay, here's the CLE code again. It's BCU1007. So Benefits Compensation University 1007. Okay, and now just flipping back quickly, Katie, you knew how to do it. I'm gonna go through the slides, but Jim, if you wanna jump back in, I think we're now to the employees returning to work section. Sure, happy to, happy to jump back in. And for those of you who might've missed the technical nuances that we just um, went over, I think HBO is developing a seven part series, action series involving an executive compensation attorney, and I'm sure they'll be you know, included in that. All right. Okay, so we've all been at home for a long time, um, but at some point we're all gonna be returning to the office or perhaps most of us will be returning to the office. So what is probably on the minds of many of you is how to, how to manage that and what are the requirements for that? Um, how will employers be managing and mandating returns to the office? Um, what employers should do to be, be doing to prepare? What, do, what to do about employees who do not want to come back to the office? Can the employer require them to work in the office? And we'll talk about some policies and procedures and accommodations. Um, Marsh is going to talk about how, you know, in general, in principle, employers can set the terms and conditions of employment and can require employees to work in the office remotely. Uh, Marsha, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yes. So in, in inquiring minds want to know the answers to all of these questions. And um, as we know, the, the law, the facts, the world we live in are still developing. So, uh, so what we can do is give you some principles that can help you to start thinking about these things. And then we are finding a lot of employers consulting with us on, you know, what makes sense. And what makes sense today may not make sense tomorrow, but we can we can see a few months into the future, and we can we can help you with that, just as you can help your internal clients and, and business people. So, returning to the office. So the basic principle, and we all know this, but it's good to have a reminder, is that the employer sets the terms and conditions of employment, and in theory, the employer can say. Once the public health guidelines allow employees to come back to the office and allow offices to be open, in theory, the employer can say that the employees must come back right away, or the employer can decide to give them the option, or the employer can require some employees to come in and others not. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of optionality on the employer's part. 
Um, but there's also a number of other considerations. So employee morale, keeping uh, important talent in what still is a pretty tight labor market despite all of the dis dislocation of um, COVID. And then when you think about those things, family considerations where uh, many children, our school-age children are still um, doing school remotely or uh, you know, older relatives or extended family may be in the house with people. So there's all sorts of personal considerations that employers didn't have to think about before and are not legally obligated to think about now in many cases, but as a practical matter, employers are going to think about those things. And then we have um, visa and travel considerations. A lot of companies have executives who they've hired who are uh, not US citizens and located outside the US, and it's a challenge to get them over here. Um, some employers have employees who have traveled abroad pre-COVID and are stuck or don't want to come back. And then the other principles, of course, are the employer must avoid discriminatory treatment. So when you treat some people differently than others, there's always the possibility that somebody believes it's because they are in a protected class, because they're a woman, because of sexual orientation, because of race or, or uh, ethnicity or religion. Um, and then we have the affirmative obligations that come about through the Americans with Disabilities Acts and similar state laws. So those are all the things that are running around the background as you, the employer, are figuring out what to do. Marcia, uh, some people have to be in the office. Um, I mean, a nurse cannot, cannot work remotely at home and taking care of patients. Now, most of us don't have that stark a divider in terms of it. But I would assume that the need to be in the office or if an employer is evaluating um, you know, the functions of someone, they can take that factor into consideration and that may be particularly helpful, for example, in discrimination issues. And they can, certainly an employer can take into consideration if there's an absolute obvious need for the person to work at the workplace rather than at home. And, um, you know, even during the lockouts, typically, of course, essential employees were able to come to the office. And so for nurses and even factory workers in certain industries, um, you know, as we all have read about the, the meat packing and other, other food manufacturing, um, as well as essential industries like banks and, uh, and, and uh, law firms, um, <clears throat> for essential employees, we kind of know how to handle that because employers have been doing that for the last six months. But then you get to the, the employees who the employer judges must be in the office, but there isn't any, it's not obvious to the world at large. So, you know, those, those are challenges. But What's certainly, you, I was just going to say, if you apply the rules consistently, you have fewer dis discrimination issues. Well, let's talk about employees who state they cannot come to the office for various reasons, such as a health condition, a person who lives with a, with, with a person uh, who is at increased risk for, um, for um, COVID because of comorbidities. Yeah. So it, it, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, it, as you know, requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations to employees with a disability. It also requires employers not to discriminate against employees because they have a uh, family member or household member who themselves has a disability, even though the employee doesn't. Now, the, the uh, ADA and most state laws do not require the employer to provide a reasonable accommodation because of family disabilities. So to the extent that the employer is making an accommodation that's voluntary rather than legally required in most cases, as long as you treat people similarly. Um, but when it comes to the employee who has, as you said, a comorbidity, a pre-existing condition that makes them more susceptible to COVID, 
to the extent that there's still some risk of COVID in the workplace, which is pretty much the case anywhere in the U.S. at the moment, may not always be, but that's the case now, um, then the employee is entitled to some kind of accommodation. But it has to be reasonable and it has to not be an undue hardship. So in many cases, the remote work is going to be the reasonable accommodation, even though pre-COVID it was pretty well accepted that employers could refuse remote work as, a, as an accommodation. Um, now that becomes harder. And what about employees who say they cannot come to the office uh, for reasons about children being at home, uh, employer, employee has to travel to a place requiring quarantine, uh, employee has in close contact, what are some of the considerations there? Right, so um, here there's a, uh, a variety of new, new and old laws. Um, and there are a lot of, a, a number of states have laws that are requiring employers to allow some time off for employees who can't come to the office to either allow remote work or time off for employees who can't come to the office because they need to take care of uh, children who can't go elsewhere to be taken care of. Those, um, those laws vary from city, they have city laws, state laws. Uh, New York and California are, are, the, are the biggest in that area, but a number of states have passed these laws. So, um, so first thing first is to go over the laws that are applicable in, in the locations where you are. And of course, if you're everywhere, we have lists that, that we can give you of, of the laws. Um, but then in addition to the requirements, and of course, if you have less than 500 employees, there's the families, FFCRA, Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, um, has certain requirements about time off and same under extended FMLA. So, but let's think about the situation where um, the employee, there is no legal entitlement to relief or time off um, for the employee, then what are employers doing? Well, again, for all the, all the reasons I discussed at the beginning of this section, a lot of employers are expanding leave opportunities, putting into, into place actual new policies um, that allow employees time off uh, if they have to stay home with children, if they have to be on a precautionary quarantine to provide pay. Um, and some of these policies involve pay, some don't. It will depend on the circumstances of the, uh, of the employer and the employees. Um, and in some cases, employees can, have, can get unemployment when they're unable to work for these reasons, and then the employer may, not, may feel they don't need to pay. Um, so, way, yeah, in, go ahead. In, in a way, this is similar to our advice with expense reimbursements, and that is you've sort of got a two-part analysis. Your concerns as an employer in, in keeping, motivating, retaining employees, and then the legal obligation. And it's going to be a balancing act as to which takes priority, I think. Yeah, I, that's absolutely right. And in the case of leave, I would add another consideration, which is how do you administer all this? You, you, and a company, an HR team may get you know, 50 requests a day to be off for this reason or that reason related to COVID. And you can't possibly deal with each one of them individually um, as a practical matter. And you certainly can't maintain consistency if you do that. So uh, what we've been recommending to a lot of companies and what companies have come back to us and said works well is when the company sets up a few different policies and procedures that uh, tell HR what to do in the case of most of the questions that come up. And then if something comes up that's different or there's a reason to treat a particular person differently, you can deal with those as exceptions. You can consider them carefully as you would in any case, but you aren't dealing with 50 different questions every day. And then the employees start to know what to expect. Yes. In other words, set up 
maybe three, four, five buckets, if you will, of situations and try to have those comprehensive enough so that most of the requests will fit in one of those. And that also helps with consistency, I would imagine. Yes, it definitely helps with consistency as well as practicality and, um, you know, letting employees know what's expected of them. And I'm not going to go into this in, in great detail, but um, travel has become a real challenge um, in, in the return to work scenario because we have a variety of quarantine uh, requirements in different cities and states uh, and also applying to different countries. And so when people travel for personal travel, uh, it, it can put the workplace at risk or it makes it difficult for the person to come back to work. And so that's actually travel is one of the sets of challenges that it's good for employers to think about ahead. And that, that, that leads to a question. Uh, can an employee sue an employer if the employee believes he or she has contracted COVID from working in the office and perhaps give it to a household member as a result of working in the office? And could the household employer, household member sue? Yeah, so we're, tr of course, as you might expect, there's all sorts of new and um, innovative litigation that is coming out of these situations, and we're tracking all that. And you, you've probably seen that there was a series of um, class action uh, litigation involving food production facilities where uh, where employees or their representatives claimed that um, not only were they being put in danger, but that the facility was a public nuisance because like like a uh, like an, a facility that emits pollution is the theory. It's sending coronavirus out into the community. And, um, you know, what's going to happen with that, all of those litigation matters is, uh, you know, is a topic for the future. At the moment, most of them have either been dismissed or settled. But now what we're seeing is um, wrongful death uh, litigation where an employee has died after being at work. Um, and there are a number of defenses in those cases, uh, workers comp preclusion is one defense, but that's different from state to state. Um, an another defense obviously is causation. Well, the person came to work, but what else were they doing? Um, mm -hmm. Can you prove that they, that they uh, were infected at work? Can you prove that they wouldn't have died but for that infection? Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of you know, you feel terrible when something like that happens and, and the employer obviously is going to, to really feel badly and want to help. On the other hand, they're not going to be, want to pay out millions and millions of dollars for something that, you know, may not be their fault at all. So those are, um, those are a few of the kinds of litigation that are working their way through the courts now. And, uh, where COVID remains a risk, we just talked about how we have the legal analysis and we have, um, you know, the human resource policy. Um, they interact, and that is, you have can adopt more generous policies, but whatever you do, you should be keeping good records because it helps in litigation, it helps in dealing with similar circumstances, and supports consistency in cer similar circumstances. Exactly what a litigator would have said. All right, when COVID, and we're getting close to our time, so we're gonna go quickly through this. Um, when COVID is no longer a risk, when an employee doesn't have a justified reason for, for remaining at home, perhaps, um, any thoughts on that? Yes, the thought is employers should, um, they're busy all the time, but they should set aside time every couple of months to revisit the situation and see where are we? Are we in the place where what we've been doing works or do we need to change it? That's the basic advice. Super. Ryan, I'm gonna turn it back um, to odds and ends. 
and Ryan, I can go through these or you can go through these however you'd like. No, yeah, we can go quickly. And I, um, you know, we I discussed the cause definition earlier, and I think we raised it, but there are a couple notes here too, and Marcia can jump in quickly with thoughts too. But I do think, again, people should review cause with the current events more in mind because of all the different things that have come up with executives and companies that end up sort of with egg on their face when they have to pay out severance, despite what the public views as clear wrongdoing, but may not fit the definition of cause. And I think there's a helpful thought here on code of conduct, company policy. If those things are frequently updated by companies, then referring to those in the definition of cause and material violation of those things should be sufficient, I, I think. But um, Marsha and Jim, if you want to jump in on those. Yeah, I, I agree that, that having it having the code of conduct refer specifically to, uh, to harassment or have rules about even consensual relationships gives the company a, um, a, a window into cause. Also, conducting an internal investigation to make sure that you have the facts to back up a decision is, is very important. Um, and there are some other things that we just, again, these are odds and ends, and we noted them simply because this is stuff that comes across for, for our desks. Um, what we'd like to see is um, overbroad indemnity provisions and employment agreements that do not take applicable corporate law and the company's bylaws into consideration. Bylaws can, of course, change, but what you can include in the employment agreement if you're representing an executive is the bylaws as in effect as of a certain date. Um, uh, and for public companies, we'd like to see clawback authorizations in their agree in the in the agreements of the executives. Um, it does drive me crazy when an employment agreement uh, contractually gives the right of to, of, a, of an executive to be on the board. In case of a public company, the so shareholders may disagree. You can solve that by saying that the the employment the company has a contractual right to nominate. Uh, an executive for the board. Um, one thing that uh, drives me crazy too is we want to fire an executive. We don't. We don't want to pay him or her severance. Can you figure out a way that we don't have to pay severance? Well, as I said, usually by the time this gets to me, there's a bunch of emails going back and forth that are not protected. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a horrible chain that would probably defeat that type of claim. Um, and also, my experience over the years of doing executive compensation is that the courts do not like overreaching companies, and they don't like overreaching executives. Um, they don't want, you know, if, if you're trying to uh, deny somebody severance when they're entitled to it, it just doesn't work out most of the time if it goes to litigation in a final decision. Um, my pet peeve, uh, we, won't, we don't have time for it, but uh, restrictive covenants are changing each year as, as more states develop laws, um, restricting restrictive covenants and providing requirements such as notice uh, in advance, um, mi minimum uh, severance in some instances. Uh, Washington State, as I mentioned last year, is particularly difficult. You you have to pay a great deal of attention to uh, the restrictive covenants in Wash the state of Washington. Um, um, there must be, and one of the things is there must be some way of preventing executive in California from working for our rival. Sometimes um, people say, well, "We will let's put a restrictive covenant in there, even though it's not enforceable." I can assure you, everybody in California knows that restrictive covenants in employment agreements are not enforceable. Um, years and years ago, an insurance company paid two million bucks for putting one in. Uh, and it's also there's been recent a recent Court of Appeals case in California, which is uh, is is come down on non solicitation provisions also not being enforceable in California. Um, so I, I'll just say just to pop in from the litigation perspective, we like a challenge. So if you come to us early about firing an executive, there's often as a strategy, come to us early about California, we can't change the law, but there sometimes is a strategy. Yep, sounds good. Ryan, I'm gonna turn it back to you because we are right at our hour. 
Yeah, so we're, yeah, no, thanks, Jim. I, perfect. So the, the last part is a summary on changes in state laws and restrictive covenants. So feel free to review those slides nicely. They're, they summarize, I think, a lot of it pretty well. And just noting real quick the distinction with restrictive covenants between, um, and this can matter still in California, between getting an injunction to preventing an employee from doing what you want to restrict them to and having, to the point of the case Katie mentioned, a condition precedent to the payment of money or retaining equity if they violate a restrictive covenant, because it's not always treated the same in states. And so it's an important distinction. And yes. then there was also, one, in York, also in New York. Yes. And then one more quick thought. There was a Q&A on can, whether or not you can make an 83B election for RSUs. And the easy answer is you cannot, unfortunately, um, only for restricted stock. And because we're out of time, I won't do a full distinction between restricted stock and RSUs, but you cannot make an 83B election for RSUs. Um, so with that, I will complete it. I, you know, any feedback you all have, um, we appreciate you tuning in. We highly encourage you for the next two panels as well, covering different areas, but I think you'll find just, I mean, clearly find just as relevant for your companies and what's going on right now. Um, so again, thanks for joining us and we look forward to hearing your feedback and what we can do better next year on this portion. Thanks.